for you. Uh, VSM is very serious meeting, is it? <laughs> <laughs> the pun is fine. <laughs> yeah. so, okay, so uh, we were talking today about seeing the equation. This means receiving uh, receiving the photons from the equation. Yes, and not in particular is any this model or something. Okay, and we sort of hit upon something, uh, an aspect of. Uh, Accretion disk, which I was not aware of. Okay, it was there always in in front of my eyes, in front of everybody's eyes. Probably nobody saw it. Uh, uh, actually, saw it the problem there, but uh, we just sort of hit up and stumbled on it. And uh, we'll come to that today. So we basically about that. Although I have seen uh, written seeing, I'm not imaging it. Okay, so. Imaging needs a little bit more, you know, uh, technology involved. Uh, so we are working on that, but uh, still not seeing. We will be actually uh, measuring the spectra that we should be seeing. Okay. Anyway, so uh, here it goes. Oops. Yeah. So uh, it's about compact objects. So we know what are compact. Objects. I, I will not go into details of that because you know, most of you know what it is. So basically, when we say compact compact objects, it's a stellar remnants like white dwarf, neutron star, or black holes. And this word compact uh, um, object is actually measured by uh, or estimated by uh, something called compactness parameter. Okay, or compact. Uh, so. This compactness parameter is either one can express it mass by ratio or as the, as here it is written, uh, it's like the Schwarzschild radius divided by the size of the object. Okay, so, so now if we express the size of the object, this capital R, in terms of uh, x into, uh, the, in units of Schwarzschild radius, then it is just one by x. Okay, x being the unit of the size of the object uh, in terms of social radius. And if that, that is the case, then this black holes, neutron stars, and white dwarfs can quite, sorry, uh, can be sort of uh, uh, described in, by this compactness parameter. For white dwarfs, it is around 10 to the power minus 4. For neutron stars, it's around 0.2 to 0.4. And for black holes, it is around around one. While if you compare that with sun, it is around 10, uh, 10 to the power minus six. Okay, so sun is much less compact. If you do it for Earth, it would be even uh, smaller. So, so this compactness parameter sort of describes how compact uh, that that object is. Uh, in principle, we can also say a star also a compact object. So, it's a diffuse gas being compact. I mean. Uh, becomes compact in the form of a gravitating center. We can actually call a star as well uh, as a compact object, but but in general, we uh, we meant, uh, by compact object we mean the stellar remnants like black holes, neutron stars, and white dwarfs. Okay, and uh, one of the interesting thing about these compact objects, the traditional compact objects, are that that they are very dim because the gravity is so high. They're generally dim. Black holes, of course, they are black. They don't emit anything. Uh, let's forget about uh, the uh, uh, this uh, Hawking radiation because Hawking radiation is not actually a radiation. And we anyway, we won't be able to see it, but uh, that apart. So black holes are basically black, but neutron stars and white dwarfs are also quite non-luminous. So these are, you know, uh, some parameters that what are the end stage of stars that will, I mean, the projectile mass of the star that will give rise to a white dwarf or a neutron star or a black hole, and uh, what will be the end, star, end stage of the star, the, what are the typical masses of these stellar remnants, and radius, the size of these stellar remnants, the density, if you sort of the, uh, divide the total mass by the volume and so on. Right, uh, so, and there's also this compactness parameter here. Uh, so the other thing is that, as I said, that is a, it's very non-luminous. The white dwarfs are typically 
three orders of magnitude less. I mean, the luminosities are three orders of uh, magnitude less than that of sun. And for uh, neutron stars as well, if the neutron star surface is around 1 million degree Kelvin, then it is around uh, solar luminosity. Okay. But uh, uh, the accreting neutron stars are basically uh, uh, extra binaries, and extra binaries at least three to four orders of at least three to four orders of magnitude. Um, the luminosities are three to four orders of magnitude higher. Okay, and of course the black holes don't emit at all. Uh, but uh, black holes are also uh, accreting black holes are also very uh, luminous. For example, in microquasars and AGM. So. So therefore, uh, the luminosities that we get from these uh, objects, this accreting white dwarfs, accreting neutron stars, and black holes, they have to be because of conversion of the gravitational en gravitational energy released into radiation. Okay, and if you can do it a fraction of it uh, into radiation, then these enormous luminosities can be explained. Okay, so uh, these are very uh, Standard uh, uh, estimates. Uh, it's just for people who are uninitiated. I'm just doing it. But most of the people who work in this, there, it's it's pretty easy for them. So uh, uh, if if there is a mass uh, supply of uh, let's say uh, DMDT, which is the accretion rate, uh, then the gravitational energy release, if it is, if you just assume it to be uh, Newtonian gravity, will be around GM DMDT by R. And then if we sort of multiply a c squared with it. Then we can reduce this luminosity expression in terms of some efficiency factor, which is gm by c squared r. Gm by c squared is a gravitational radius. Okay, so it's basically uh, what we get here is rg by r. So and we know uh, we just uh, uh, we just showed what are the uh, compactness parameter here. So essentially, it, it is a measure of compactness parameter, and one can see if it is uh, for a black hole. Then the luminosities can be of the order of the rest mass energy of the mass supply. Okay, so that can be pretty high. Now, of course, there is a this, how you convert that gravitational energy released into radiation is of a mat, uh, uh, matter of details. Okay, and these radiations we see. Okay, so microquasars uh, typically. Uh, which are uh, you know extra binaries with one as a neutron star or a black hole, and the other as a normal star. AGNs, of course, are the centers of black hole, uh, galaxies, and there uh, because uh, there is mass supply, so the centers of galaxies are very active. They they sort of emit a lot of uh, radiation, and they outshine the rest of the galaxy, and so on. Which again you all know, but the luminosities one can see are very high. 10 to the 34 to 39 for microquasars and 42 to 48 uh, for AGMs. So, so once it was uh, in the 1960s, it was uh, uh, sort of realized that it is the matter that is falling in and the gravitational energy released is converted into, into the radiation. So to understand the physics of that, so uh, uh, there was a frantic search for uh, accretion models. So this matter falling in is called accretion. Uh, and uh, so there were a lot of uh, uh, research on how, what, what, what should be the accretion disk model. Uh, sorry, not accretion disk. Accretion disk, the idea of disk came later. But uh, accretion models. Uh, uh, now that there are a few things along with uh, this uh, uh, enormous luminosity that we see from uh, these uh, centers of galaxies or microquasars. That is that there are ejection of matters, collimated matters are ejected, which are also called astrophysical jets from these objects. Not all, but many of them, many jets are associated with, uh, uh, with many of these uh, objects. And the continuum spectra, if you actually see the continuum spectra, it has a strong power law uh, uh, component. Uh, the, the, there will be a thermal black body modified or, or what should I say, modified black body uh, component, but there is also a strong power law uh, component as well. Uh, and uh, so, so if, if a accretion, disk mo uh, uh, accretion model has to 
uh, explain uh, the physics, then they have to also explain these continuum spectra, how the matters uh, that uh, which is which is supposed to fall in are uh, you know expelled as jets, or sometimes they are relativistic. Uh, so the, well, an accretion model has to actually answer all of them together. And uh, as I said, that uh, this jet, this is, I think, uh, GRS1915105, this uh, matter separating out, it, uh, these actual observations. Uh, this small star here is the, uh, this uh, com unresolved compact object. And this uh, red and blues are the matter that is, is separating out. And uh, this is uh, Cygnus X1 uh, continuum spectra, as I said. There is a, a thermal black body and a strong uh, uh, power law component. Uh, here, this is, this is called the hard state. Hard state means the power uh, maximizes in the hard part of the spectrum. And the soft state means when the power uh, maximizes the soft part of the spectrum, that is the lower, I mean, lower energy part of the spectrum uh, for six signal six. So these are very dated, I mean, with much better uh, spectra is now available, but I just took it from the web and uh, just put it there just to uh, give the overall uh, idea. There, of course, these two states are uh, connected by many intermediate states, uh, but again, uh, those are a matter of details. And apart from that, the jets are also seen seen only for microquasars, they are only seen in the hard or hard intermediate states and not in soft states. So these jet states are also uh, uh, are, are correlated with the accretion state. So these are, this is a nature paper by Mirabel and Rodney in 99, and we made a lot of splash uh, at that time. And I just entered my PhD at that time. So this was a sort of a big deal at that time. I mean, but now nowadays we have better uh, uh, spectra much uh, with longer trends. In fact, AstroSat has a better uh, light curve than what we have it here. Now, a much a longer uh, uh, train of this light curve. So, uh, but anyway, what it showed was that when uh, this is this black is the X-ray, red is the infrared, and uh, blue is the radio here. And uh, when there is a high state in uh, in the in X-rays, which are coming from the accretion disk. Uh, then there is uh, no jet activity, but as it dips, the this infrared and radio starts to increase. And uh, before, after this spike, there is a relativistic ejection. Okay, they measured it. I think 92% speed of light or 94% speed of light, something like that, in this paper. And uh, so that and and this war and this coinage microquasar came because it's a it's kind of a smaller quasar. Um, and uh, then Fender and Belloni, and this is called Q diagram. This is very well known in in microquasar circles. So they so what they have measured are the jet states and then the intensity of the X rays with the hardness ratio. Hardness ratio is the uh, uh, the the flux in the high uh, high energy divided by the flux in the low energy, the, the ratio of that uh, in the x-axis and in the y-axis they have an intensity and they have this hysteresis kind of a uh, of a behavior that uh, these uh, microquasar shows okay this black hole microquasar shows so it, it repeats over and over and over again and. Uh, so, uh, so what it what it shows that this is the is, is in the soft state, and this is say the typically hard state. So, in, when it is in a typically hard state, then the the jet activity starts. The radio can be seen. The radio uh, emission can be seen, and then it goes from this typically hard state to hard intermediate, goes up, and the jet becomes stronger. And when uh, it from this hard intermediate to when it moves to the soft. And then there is a relativistic ejection. And then once the relativity, relativistic ejection is there, uh, then it goes to the soft state. Soft, soft state means this state, this state with the dominant uh, thermal uh, and a weak power law. So uh, we, it goes there and then uh, of course it repeats in, 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 in three to four months, okay. Uh, or it depends on the mass of the uh, central object as well. So 
what would be the cycle it also depends on the mass uh, for some objects it's smaller and some objects it's, it's larger so, all right yes can i can i interrupt in the, the last slide uh, so yeah this is uh, the roman script one two three four which ones are the soft and hard can you just uh, which one here yeah uh the vhs are by yes where is the one and two and three and four? Oh, okay 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 so one is here sorry yeah one is here when it's it's hard state so hard state means the this is hardness ratio so uh, the the uh the power is in the hard part of the spectrum okay so it's so, mostly x-rays then it is completely x-ray so if you look at this is although sickness x1 okay okay so uh so here it is a, a completely x-ray it's 0.1 to say uh, you know uh, hundreds of uh, kv okay and then in, in the soft state goes up to mev but uh, it's very weak and okay. uh, this, the it, it it maximizes around 1 kv okay so in microquasars 1 kv is, is around 1 kv is soft and uh, 10 plus to 30 40 50 these are called hard state hard hard x-rays hundreds are the hard x-rays so it means that a hard state means in this state but in this state is also uh, although it's in the hard and the spectrum is hard but uh, the luminosity is low so that's why it's called ls low hard state okay so uh, so this one is here so when it, when it is one you start to see the jet activity that is you can see the, you, you can measure the radio if you do a simultaneous or quasi simultaneous observations and then that the, the uh, it will start to uh, in, i mean the luminosity will start to increase it will still remain hard it will get slightly soft but still remain hard and it will sort of in, uh, the luminosity will go up and the jet the the radio power will also increase and then then it will start to become soft here it is this uh, uh, hard in this is state the intermediate state okay and just before entering the soft state which is it will it will become extremely steep but it will eject this uh, uh, which means you can start see this disc at that time yeah? uh, uh okay so even a, a capillary disc uh in uh, in uh, microquasars for example again uh, i just i'm just showing you one example but it's not good to show you one example here even in the hard state sickness x1 you can see that this the capillary disc part this is the, cap the emission from the capillary disc. Okay. Okay. okay but it is weak there are some objects for example gro i'm forgetting the name of that object Okay, but uh, uh, yeah, and uh, there are two, three objects in which during the hard state you don't see this uh, this this uh, 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 this disc component at all. Okay, you only see this uh, uh, this uh, power law part. Okay, and in in the soft state, this power law becomes very weak; it slumps, but then uh, the the capillary disc part increases. Okay. okay thanks. Thanks. So that's uh, some somewhere here. So the, so it's like hard, hard intermediate or intermediate states, and then it's VHS. There's very high state, uh, state, and then soft, and it then then it goes into this this state. These states, I mean, it's not written here. These states are also called the quasi states. That it's very weak. Everything is very weak. The power law is weak. The entire uh, luminosity has gone down, and so on. Okay. In some of the objects, it goes below the detection limit uh, uh, level as well. Okay. So, and uh, this is again. Sir, I had a question in the last slide. Uh, so, in the left left part of the same uh, image, there are two branches. So, this can one, it happen? Okay, this one. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Yes. Yes. Go ahead. I understood. Yeah. Yes. Yes. There are two branches. So. Uh, can the source be divided into two groups depending on in which branch the source yeah, will? I, mean, okay, I, I did not go into the, all the details here, but the point is 
I mean, this is an overall, this Q diagram is an overall uh, average description. Okay. Some of the objects, what it will do, it will come here and it will not go down here. It will go there and it will sort of loop here and then after some time it go down. For example, GRS 191, uh, 191.5105, it is a very famous uh, object. Uh, Vishwajit Paul will be very, uh, I mean, it was a big deal in TIFR in uh, late 90s and early 2000s. Uh, so Vishwajit Paul will be knowing about it. So, uh, so it, it, that GRS1915, it, it stays in that, that uh, middle branch. It never leaves and goes down to that uh, Q diagram. This Q diagram is, is basically an average curve that they have done on an average all, they put all the microquasars and see that at, at saw that the, most of the microquasars does that, but some of the microquasars do not complete the uh, Q diagram uh, at all, okay? So they can just go into that branch in between, this said, right? This, these two branches, they can go down and this, this come back and go down. It is sort of oscillate there, rock up and there, okay? Right, right. Sometimes they do a loop, sometimes they do a rock. Okay. So, uh, so these are much more complicated stuff and uh, okay, uh, I'm not addressing them at the moment. But what I'm trying to say, is these are the average uh, behavior. Right, right. okay. All right. All right, so uh, this is uh, M87. Okay, this is again dated. We have better pictures now in M87, and I deliberately did not put it here, okay, because this uh, this donut shape of M87 I did not deliberately put, uh, because uh, yeah, I mean basically if, if people have seen it far too much. Uh, so, but anyway, so here uh, this is uh, this is a uh, uh, 20 years of uh, uh, of uh, observation. Stacked observation. I took it from Biratta's web page, and uh, he's one of the uh, experts on M87. And it, you can just see that the matter is actually coming out from the central object, uh, around the central object, not from the central object. And uh, now we know the central. We have seen the central object. It, it's measured around four into ten to the power nine solar mass. Sorry, six into ten to the power nine solar mass. Uh, it's a big, uh, massive uh, black hole there. But uh, so the, the point here is that it is Junor, Birat, and Libyo in 1999 in Nature. They first showed that the 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 rate the uh, jets that are coming out. Okay. By the way, uh, M87 jet is the first astrophysical jet that we saw. That was that was detected, and uh, in 1960. No, sorry, 1918 by Curtis. Uh, in 1918, in, in optical, they saw it, okay, and they, uh, uh, Curtis uh, uh, termed in his paper as a, um, something like, uh, what was it, a curious ray coming out, okay, at uh, two o'clock, that's what he, he, uh, he mentioned in his paper. So, anyway, so it's very well studied jet, and you can see it in radio, then this is in optical and this is again in radio. So uh, it is very well studied jet. And uh, this is also radio image and you can see that this, I mean, if you stack the image for 20 years, you can see that sort of belching out, matter belching out. Uh, uh, and what they showed that, Junor uh, Birathe and Livio, that it is coming out from a region smaller than 100 Schwarzschild radius. This was uh, bettered by Dullman in, uh, Chef Tulman, you know, he's a famous now for the image. Uh, uh, he better did in 2012 in a science paper, and he said that it's coming out uh, from a region few Schwarzschild radius, not even 100, okay, less than 10 Schwarzschild radius, uh, from a region uh, that small. That is really uh, very strange, uh, just you to think that this entire object is around 1 kpc, okay, this, this jet is around 1.4 kpc, one side of it. But it is coming from a region which is less than 10 Schwarzschild radius, okay? So you can just, just imagine that 
so strong matter, relativistic matter coming out, but its base is so tiny, so small. That is really something. Anyway, so uh, these are the these are the overall features of uh, accretion and jets, and uh, uh, a, a branch of uh, of the observers in in uh, microquasars and in AGN, they believe that. Uh, this dependence of these jet states with the uh, with the accretion states tells us that these jets are coming out from the accretion jet. Okay, there is no uh, observational evidence as such that it is indeed because of the accretion activity it is coming out. But uh, this um, uh, what should I say? This um, indirect evidences tells us that it is the accreting material that is being ejected as jet. Uh, of course, in in Harvick Hero uh, um, objects, uh, it is it is more clear. But anyway, not for uh, microquasars and AGN. Anyway, so this, uh, this is the uh, overall picture. There's again this um, Q diagram. Uh, so so the bottom line is that an accretion theory uh, theory of accretion should uh, give I mean uh, explain these broad observational features. Uh, related with jets, um, there's something else as well, QPO, which I'm not touching now. Anyway, so uh, uh, so the basically what it uh, also tells us that these microquasars or these uh, extra binaries, they behave in a small scale, behave like quasar. So these black hole binaries or black hole ob these objects containing black holes. Because of the democratic nature of black hole, that is, matter has to, has to cross the horizon with the speed of light, no matter what is, what is, whatever might be your outer boundary condition. So that controls the inner bound, uh, the, the, the physics around the black hole. And this democratic nature of black holes, they sort of, uh, uh, they sort of scale down the, for smaller black holes into microquasars and for larger black, black holes as quasars. But essential features are same, uh, similar, not same, but similar. Okay, so uh, so that's that's the background of this. Okay, so now uh, the the question is that uh, we have to understand this uh, this object. So it is fine as we just showed that uh, uh, we discussed that uh, we can estimate that this enormous luminosities can be obtained uh, uh, by by assuming it to be. Uh, you know, a fraction of matter, uh, uh, the, the fraction of gravitation, gravitational energy released due to the accreting matter into radiation. But to actually calculate those radiations, you have to actually solve the matter around uh, uh, these black holes and neutron stars to, in order to able to, uh, to uh, uh, compute the spectra. Of these objects and then match them and then look at the luminosities and so on, right? So there was a, uh, I mean, there was, a, as, as I said, there was a frantic, you know, uh, uh, effort in, in, in accretion disk models, research in accretion disk models. So uh, the basic hydrodynamic equations are these the continuity equations we know and the Euler equation, okay? Uh, a very simple model I'm taking uh, just to explain things. Uh, complicated stuff we we'll put later. So you have the advection term here. This is uh, u is the radial velocity. So this is the advection term. You have the uh, pressure gradient term and you have the gravity term. I put g equals to m equals to one. And here is the continuity equation. Okay. So in steady state, I can you can say that why you're taking steady state? Why not in um, uh, time dependent? The point is the time dependent studies can be only done through, uh, through uh, simulations, uh, numerical simulations. But to understand numerical simulations, we need to understand, uh, we should have an idea about uh, this steady state solution. So that helps us to, to interpret the results, uh, what uh, computer uh, gives out, because computer simulation results are, are very good. But the problem is, it really depends a lot on the boundary conditions you put. Okay, so if you do not, if you do not have the some basic idea about the physics, computer simulations, we will not be able to really un, uh, you know interpret what these computer simulations are, are giving us. 
Okay. Anyway, so having said that, so we so what we did, what we do here is we go into uh, steady state. So in the steady state, the del del t is goes off, the uh, time dependence goes off. So this is the continuity equation. This is the this becomes the Euler equation. Okay. And uh, so if we uh, so the first accretion disk model was given by Bondi, uh, Herman Bondi in 1952, long time back. Okay. And he actually solved these two equations. Okay. And so this is the Bondi uh, you have the gravitating center. He took a Newtonian uh, star and he studied how the matter is falling in. There, it was a big deal then. Why it is a big deal? It was a big deal. I, I'll come to that in, in a moment. Okay. So, yeah. Uh, then uh, uh, it, it lost favor. The Bondi equation lost favor because, uh, it, it, because it is radial uh, flow. It spends too little time outside the compact object in order to generate the luminosity. To, in order to generate those photons, this huge number of photons, you need really, you know, you need time to do that, right? So this infall time scale has to be less, or at least comparable to the uh, to the radiation, uh, the cooling time scale, in order to generate a lot of uh, photons. As we can see in case of uh, microquasars and and uh, um, uh, agents, the the amount of radiation is really high. Okay, so therefore, so this uh, Bondi flow lost favor. Um, then the next came the what is known as the standard uh, disk or the Keplerian disk or the Shakura uh, Sunayev disk. And in Shakura Sunayev disk, if you take this, if this you consider this as the uh, uh, the momentum, uh, the Euler equation, the momentum balance equation. Then, so what uh, Shakura and Sunayev did, they got rid of the uh, advection terms, they dropped these terms, and also they ignored the pressure gradient term in the radial direction, and then they balanced the centripetal uh, with the gravity, and uh, so therefore uh, your angular momentum is basically Keplerian angular momentum distribution, they, so they did not have to solve the, uh, the uh, momentum equation. They only solved for the uh, first law of thermodynamics or the energy balance and the angular momentum um, transport through viscosity. Okay, so if they do that, then they what you end up with is what is called the Kepler disk or the Sakura Sunayev disk or the standard disk. So it's something like this. It's very thin, and the central object. Uh, so it is, this is a, a, a cross-sectional view. And uh, the matter is actually rotating. We are not really falling very much. The advection is very small. Uh, very uh, the, the the advection term is, is almost negligible. But anyway, but the luminosity what what uh, it did was they got the luminosity, uh, typical luminosity that we saw. However, as I showed in the two of this uh, and the Cygnus X1 uh, uh, spectra, they have. A very strong, uh, significant uh, uh, power law. This this component does not generate the power law. Okay, so that's the uh, uh, that's uh, uh, what should I say? The uh, that's the uh, I should not say that's the failure, but it's the limitation uh, of Keplerian test. Okay, and then therefore. Uh, after 1973, <coughs> although this was termed as a standard disk, a lot of people did, I mean, uh, many uh, disk models. The next uh, uh, popular was the what is called the thick disk. These, these are also called the Polish donuts because it was uh, in the shape of a donut while it, it was generated by um, the, um, scientists from Poland like Bodan Kaczynski, Petrona Brownovich, and so on. And if you look at the, again, the uh, momentum balance equation or the force equation, and if you again neglect the advection terms, you just keep the pressure gradient term and the gravity term and the centripetal, uh, the angular momentum term. And if you solve them, what you get is this Polish tokens. Okay. However, it was very good in the sense the luminosity was high as well as uh, it was giving rise to that um, uh, power law. Uh, but uh, the problem was it was unstable. It was shown that uh, if you have a non-exosymmetric uh, uh, 
uh, perturbations, the perturbation grows. The main reason was this was like Polish donuts. So whatever uh, perturbation that was uh, put on the outside as they advect, as they go in, they get reflected from these walls and they grow up. They grow and then after some time it destroys the, the structure. So it was unstable. But what I mean, basically the problem was they did not take the uh, you know the great uh, the the advection terms. If you take the advection terms, these instabilities goes away. Okay. So the point is that you have to take all the terms and then you have to solve. So, uh, so you have to take the advection term. So we take the advection term. Now, if you take the advection term, there are a few things that one has to uh, understand. Okay. So, I'm, so I will take the example of a bondi flow, the simplest flow, to you know put forth the points that I want to um, uh, I, I want to mention. Okay. So now, if you take this continuity equation as we did, I showed before, and you integrate that. Then what we get is the accretion field. Now, if you take the Euler equation, and if you uh, say that it is it is adiabatic uh, flow, then the energy equation becomes the adiabatic relation p equals to k over the per gamma, right? So you take that, you take this, <coughs> and you integrate, and you use this m dot as well. If you integrate, then what you left, what you get is the Bernoulli equation. Okay, so this. This is the kinetic energy term, this is the enthalpy term, and this is the gravity, gravitational potential term. And that remains constant. This is a constant of motion. Okay. And if you combine this energy equation or this adiabatic relation with this uh, accretion rate equation, then you can write these two in this form. Okay. A, a B is the sound speed. Uh, to the uh, to the part n, n is the polytropic index. Polytropic index is one by gamma minus one. U is the radial velocity and R is the uh, radial coordinates, right? This M dot is a measure of entropy. So this is also called the entropy accretion. Bondi, Herman Bondi actually, without specifying all these, he actually took this, but he, he, he I mean, uh, his explanation was completely different, but actually what he was taking is the entropy accretion. And what he showed that there is one solution for which this, this entropy accretion rate or the measure of entropy is the highest. Okay. So, and he, he chose that solution. Those are the transonic solutions. And this, he, he proposed that, that that is the solution because by second law of thermodynamics, entropy should be more for a physical process. Okay. So, so that's what he, so if this is uh, details of the solution. So you will you will cross a sonic point uh, because if you uh, simplify those equations, it becomes du dr. It is a numerator by denominator, and at some point, this both numerator and denominator goes to zero. That's a sonic point where the flow speed crosses the sound speed, local sound speed. Okay, and uh, so this transonic solution, this is the Mach number of the flow. So this is for the accretion, and this is for the wind. And this is a subsonic, completely hash subsonic solution. This is a completely supersonic solution. And these are unphysical in the sense these are multi-valued solutions. Okay. So what he showed that amongst all these global solutions, global means the solutions that are connecting the uh, star surface with infinity, amongst those, the ones with the maximum entropy is the transonic solution. So he said that these would be the solutions that would be preferred. And in his paper, he also mentions that how does it know that it has to choose the entropy, highest entropy solution? He says that as long as it does, he cannot choose, it will be uh, uh, time dependent. The moment it, it can choose the uh, uh, highest entropy solution, it will be, it will uh, achieve the steady state. Okay. So, uh, so it, till it it, achieve, uh, it can it can latch on to the uh, transonic solution, it will be time dependent. Okay, so that was uh, in his paper he mentioned. Although the language in which I am saying and the language he said is is a little bit different because all these ideas were not very clear in 1952. Okay, so uh, so then if we if we put some rotation, so if it is 
uh, still Newtonian gravity, we put a rotation. Lambda is the angular momentum, uh, specific angular momentum there. Uh, if if you uh, we can make it a little stronger with the uh, with the pseudo potential here, so we, uh, Patrick's give it a pseudo potential, um, or we can take a pure general realistic, a purely general realistic uh, equation of motion. So here you can see that URs are the four velocity, radial four velocity. And the gravity has uh, enters as a separate term, and then it also couples with the pressure gradient term through GRR and UR UR because gravity is also inside UR, uh, the radial uh, four velocity. So gravity now it becomes a nonlinear uh, gravity and it enters everywhere. Okay, so of course, including dissipation uh, makes uh, like viscosity makes these solutions much difficult, but it can be done. Okay, and it was done and we found all sorts of solutions. So now, if you take the advective, uh, uh, so advection terms as well, then there are many solutions. There are not one single solution. So if you have to start with one energy, one angle. So this L naught is the angular momentum on the horizon. Okay. So how I solved it, forget about that. Okay. It's a bit complicated. It's not not required as well for this talk. So you have all sorts of solutions. Okay. And it was fine, and most, I mean, we have, uh, we did simulations of this, and we have some, many things, I forget about that. But there is one problem here, okay? So I'm, I'm plotting one of the solutions here, all the, so this is the Mach number, this is the sound speed, this is the Bernoulli parameter, right? You see, this Bernoulli parameter remains constant. Bernoulli parameter is not defined only for uh, invisible flow. It is also for the dissipative flow. So if you have dissipation and everything and integrate the entire uh, equation of motion, you will get an uh, integration constant, that is E, which is the, we call generalized Bernoulli parameter. But anyway, that's uh, constant. This is the velocity, you see on the horizon it reaches the velocity of light, and this is the entropy measure, this is the dot. Uh, yes? Okay, so wh what we see here is that the, this is the temperature. This is uh, temperature, thermal energy in terms uh, uh, in terms of the rest mass energy of the electrons. Okay, this theta, kT by m is squared, <coughs> and that in the in in the last ten Schwarzschild radius is above ten to the power eleven degree Kelvin. Okay, and if it's for Schwarzschild, this is for Schwarzschild black hole. But if you do it car, it can easily reach ten to the power twelve degree Kelvin. Okay. But that is way too hot. Spectra does not show that you have so much hot electrons uh, present, which will be giving. I mean, it, 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 that, that means you, you will always have a, a hard spectra, okay, and very hard spectra in the MeV range all the time. That's not what we see. The point here is that it is a one temperature, frame, okay. That means we have assumed that the electrons, because if it is so hot, it has to be fully ionized, and you you should have electrons and protons, okay. But uh, we have assumed here that electrons and protons are having a same temperature, okay? T equals to T2 equals to some T, okay, right? But the, the radiative properties of protons and electrons are completely different, okay? The electrons are, uh, uh, I mean, the Bremsstrahlung emission of electrons are much stronger than protons. The synchrotron emissions are, depending, of course, on magnetic fields, but uh, synchrotron emissions are also uh, significantly uh, more for electrons. And if you talk about comptonization, the, the electrons uh, interact with, the cross-section of electrons with uh, photons are um, larger, much larger than the, the with the protons, right? So, so the radiative properties are different. And because these are compact objects, the gravity is very strong, the matter is also falling very fast, okay? So this, so you the the electrons are radiating much more than the protons. That's number one. Number two, they also fall very fast, right? So they don't have time to in one place to communicate with each other, okay? Right? Before they can communicate through uh, Coulomb coupling or some other uh, energy exchange terms, they fall. Okay? So they cannot. They do not have the time to achieve that thermal equilibrium between the protons and the electrons, okay? So in general, protons and electrons will not have same temperature, okay? And if you actually 
look at uh, Spitzer's book. It's a very old book, 1960s. I think physics of ionized gas or something like that. Its name, and you will see that there the relaxation times are calculated for Newtonian uh, fluid, and uh, the uh, electron-proton uh, relaxation time scales are larger, much larger than electron-electron or proton-proton uh, time scales. Okay, so so two temperature, two temperature means the electrons achieving one temperature. I mean, relaxing into one temperature. And the protons relaxing to another temperature distribution is a more realistic flow. Okay. Now, okay. And the name of the book is uh, Physics of the Fully Ionized Gases. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, I forgot the name. Yeah. So, so here what we have used, uh, okay, so fluid equations, uh, they, by themselves, you cannot solve them. You need an equation of state. Equation of state is a, is a closure relation. Uh, between the thermodynamic quantities, okay, and it can be uh, calculated from uh, kinetic theory from the first principles. And for uh, relativistic fluid, it was first done by Chandrasekhar, okay, but it, it is very complicated, difficult to implement in, in uh, simulation codes. So we uh, present, uh, we gave a simpler version of that in 2009, and that's the uh, uh, we are using it, forget it. So it now, now the adiabatic indexes depends on temperature, they depend on composition and so on. So it's not important. Okay. And uh, just uh, as an aside, we take all the general relativistic and special relativistic um, uh, aspects in when, when we calculate the spectrum. Okay, so that there are two things I just uh, tell you as a part of information. I'll not go into details of it. Okay, now the main issue. Okay. We, what are the equations we have? The equations we have is the mass conservation equation, the uh, radial momentum balance equation. We also should have the azimuthal uh, momentum balance equation. Uh, if you have viscosity in which uh, transports angular momentum, uh, we, and for the particular case, we are not, we are not considering that. Just make it simple, uh, simpler. Okay. And the energy balance equation or the first law of thermodynamics or what I wrote as entropy generation equation. Okay. All right. So in, in one temperature uh, regime, if you take all the, these three equations, then there are two unknowns, okay? And if you integrate these two, you get one constant of motion, and here you already have one constant of motion. So you have basically two constants of motion and two unknowns, that's V, and V means the radial flow and the uh, temperature, okay? All right, so this set of equations are complete. But if you have two temperature regime, the electrons and protons have different temperature, but the number of equations are exactly the same. Okay. And what do you get? If that is the case, what do you get? So this is we are we are taking so the same set of equations. Now we are uh, giving the same accretion rate. Sorry, where is it? Yeah, same accretion rate. Beta is some parameter which uh, sort of parameterize the gas pressure with the magnetic pressure and so on to calculate the uh, synchrotron emission. Lambda is the specific angular momentum, okay, and E is the total energy, okay. So there are the two constants of motion, E and M, M dot here, okay, and now we solve it. For one temperature, for this parameters, I have only one transonic solution. Okay, and for which T in is the entropy, uh, sorry, the uh, temperature near the horizon, very close to the horizon. We can't go up to the horizon because there's a coordinate similarity. Okay, right. But what about two temperature? So what, what we do for two temperature is very close to the horizon, that is this T in, we give a electron, uh, sorry, a, a proton temperature. Just we supply a proton temperature. Okay, and we give the constants of motion. This, this E, M dot, this lambda, and so on, right? So we, we give that, right? And then what we do, because these are constants of motion, we iterate with theta and at this at that point and the velocity, uh, radial velocity, radial three velocity. We iterate with that, we'll get to one, I mean, these values with these values will integrate out. And we'll, we'll change that theta in and for that theta, we'll get again uh, uh, by keeping theta p and e constant. Okay, 
we'll change theta and we'll get a VE. And we change that theta until we get a transonic solution. Okay, so it, it will we'll find the transonic solution. So this solution with this, you can see this is the same set of parameters, right? But the proton temperature near the horizon, near the horizon is we took, I think it is, uh, uh, I, it's, uh, one is, the, uh, wait, the two is the uh, horizon. Then we took 2.001 is, is very close to the horizon. So that's the, we call R in, okay? Asymptotically close to the horizon. So that there the temperature for which, uh, the proton temperature for which we got this transonic solution is this, 2 into 2.01, 10 to the 11 degree Kelvin, okay? Now we change the TP, okay? We give another TP, all right? You see, the solution completely changed. We give another, solution completely changed. The constants and motions are exactly the same, but we are changing. But we, for one temperature, it does not change. But for two temperature, it does change. And uh, this is the thesis work of one, uh, of one of my students, Shilpa. And when Shilpa came up with this, I said she, I mean, I, it took one month to understand that she was not making any mistake. I said, no, no, you're making a mistake. Go back and do it again. And then I understood, oh God, this is something great. Nobody saw it. In fact, it's not nobody saw it. Leon and Thompson, 1980, when he was writing a, a very famous paper, he mentions it that we don't know what is TE and TP. Although he doesn't does not say that it is degenerate, but uh, he uh, he mentions it. Okay, but nobody takes uh, any uh, what should I say any any notice of this fact. Okay. So people, what people do, they choose a boundary and they arbitrarily choose a relation between TP and T. Okay. And then they solve it. Okay. So therefore, in two temperature, you will see there are many two temperature papers, each with different, uh, you know, uh, assumptions uh, at what boundary, what is the relation between TP and T. Okay. Not always they will say, I'm putting a relation between TP and T. They will say, I am. Uh, uh, we are saying that the the electron uh, radiation uh, the, the the emissivity is equal to the uh, the coulomb coupling term okay so that is another assumption okay so all arbitrary assumptions okay so that's what when we saw that then i i just you know i was i was was very frustrated i know i did not know how to solve this equation and then just a, as a last bit of hope, I just told her that let us calculate the entropy because in fluids, apart from this uh, constants of motion, this is another thing which is entropy. And this, with the help of this entropy, uh, Bondi selected the transonic solution. Let's see what entropy says. But there's a problem. If you look at the, uh, the, uh, uh, the energy balance equation, you can't integrate it. Okay, so this is the first law of thermodynamics. Okay, you cannot integrate this because of the presence of the Coulomb coupling term. Okay, so that was another problem because we can numerically integrate it, but numerical integration will not help because numerical integration at one R, whatever numerical integration we do, that will have no relation with another point. Okay, because Entropy, as we know, is, is indeterminate uh, by an additive constant. So we can't do that. We need a, you know, a bona fide uh, uh, analytical expression. So the last hope was near the horizon, that R in, we say, very close to the horizon, matter is falling madly. Gravity is overpowering everything else. So why should we care about the, uh, this Coulomb coupling term? Okay. So we drop the Coulomb coupling term, it becomes integrable. And when once it becomes integrable, we get an expression of rho, or this mass density, plug it in the uh, accretion rate as we did for uh, the Bondi we showed in the one, one temperature case, and we get this entropy accretion rate. Now it is more complicated, very much complicated. We have a, uh, Fe is the uh, uh, energy, thermal energy per unit mass 
of electrons. Fp is the thermal energy per unit mass of the proton. Theta E is KTE by MEC squared. Theta P is KTP by MPC squared, and so on. Okay, it's very complicated. H is the half height of the disk. UR is the pore velocity, radial pore velocity. R, of course, is the uh, radial. Okay, so with that, and then what we did, what all the solutions we solved, we plotted this M dot with the, the TP in. Okay. So this is what we did. And once we do, did that, you can see that there is a maxima. Okay. This is the one that is coming from, this branch is the one that is coming from infinity. Okay. So that this is the global branch. Forget about this branch. Okay. This is, uh, this is something else. Okay. If you have if you have uh, uh, rotation, then you can have multiple sonic points. There will be an inner sonic point and so on. But inner sonic point never goes to the uh, uh, this thing. Uh, it connects the uh, the infinity. Okay, and it's, it's there's a maximum. Okay, and we just propose that that the only way to break is is that wherever there's a maxima uh, in uh, entropy, that is the solution we should we should take. And that's what we proposed. And with that, we plotted all sorts of solutions. Again, we found, for, these are for each one of them. So this is for M.10, uh, 10 solar mass, M.0.01 uh, is the accretion rate. Beta is again the ratio of uh, magnetic to gas pressure. We took uh, stochastic magnetic field. And uh, this is for, uh, okay, so this is the lambda here. Okay, so the, the specific angular momentum is here. This is the energy, the uh, uh, capital E, the generalized Bernoulli parameter. With that, we have this solution. The entropy maximizes here. We go inside, the entropy maximizes there. So this is the, this is the, um, uh, the uh, this, 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 this plot, sorry. On the, on this blue line, we have this. So you had one sonic point. Now in the blue line, you are starting to have multiple sonic points here. You have a multiple sonic point around here. Uh, in, the, in the magenta part, you have a shock. Again, on the uh, uh, this uh, red line, you, so you get this kind of solution. As you go out, you have these kind of solutions. For these, all of them, we have this maxima of entropy. Okay, and uh, then we plotted spectra for various accretion rates, and of course, for various central black holes. And um, so the, the degeneracy part is gone. So uh, we also later on, we, this is submitted recently uh, with, uh, with uh, viscous, uh, uh, GR viscosity is, is a uh, big deal. So uh, we took a lot of time to do it, but anyway, we ultimately did it. And this is one of the solutions here. So this is M dot, which is the accretion rate. L naught is the angular momentum uh, on the horizon. E is the, uh, the generalized Bernoulli parameter. Alpha is the viscosity parameter. And with that, this is the um, Mach number, this is the velocity, the, the temperatures Tp and Te, electron and proton temperatures. The gamma E is the adiabatic indexes for the pressure, uh, the protons and the electrons. This is the number density, and this is the U sub phi. Uh, U, L is the U sub phi, the, the uh, mm, well, uh, the covariant component of the uh, Azimuthal component of the four block. Okay. And these are the emissivities. Uh, this is, uh, okay, so this is the blue one is the Bremsstrahlung. This is the synchrotron, uh, the, the violet. The red is the comprised uh, Bremsstrahlung. And the, the, uh, this uh, saffron is the comprised synchrotron. And the, these are the spectra. Okay, this is for low, very low accretion rates. So you see uh, the, the luminosity is very low, but if you go higher up, you will get uh, higher, I mean, uh, high luminosity. Uh, as you can see here, the luminosity can go very high. Okay. All right. So uh, here in this particular case, oh, I forgot what are the parameters here, but anyway. So here what we did, we tried to see from which part, what, uh, which part of the equation disk, uh, the, the, spectra is, is, uh, is contributing. So what we can see here that the most of the radiation is coming 
from this region. Okay, beyond three to a ten social radius is the region. Ninety percent of the radiation is coming between three and uh, and ten social radius. Okay, so and also they are they are very hot uh, photons as well. All right, so we can do that for uh, black holes. But what about neutron stars? The problem with neutron stars, I mean. A lot of people have done many uh, theoretical work on neutron stars, but generally what people do is that they take an accretion column and they make it, I mean, with pre-fall matter falls, okay? And then there's a mound, thermal mound and so on, okay? And then a lot of radiation is going on, interaction with radiation and matter and so on. So that's what people did, but not many people did started with, uh, with a, uh, by dipolar magnetic field and from accretion disk, it channeled that into this curtain accretion curtains or accretion funnels, whatever you call it, onto the neutron star uh, holes. So, uh, and uh, what we did, uh, we, before we did that for one temperature, now we extended it for, uh, for two temperatures. Because this, this degeneracy problem will also be there for neutron stars. Okay, so this is roughly a schematic diagram of the magnetized accretion flow. But this can be, whatever we did can be extended to any magnetized stars as well. Okay, not just neutron stars. All right, so, but the problem with the neutron star is that neutron stars are bigger and just outside the neutron star, it is not free fall. The matter is not falling free fall, unlike the black. So if it is not free fall, we cannot write the expression of entropy. And if you cannot write the expression of entropy, we cannot remove the degeneracy. So what to do? So what we did in, in this uh, paper also, we used a, a, a property of gravity. The, that property of gravity is basically that or, I mean, basically, Gauss's law. So, whether this, uh, 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 this whatever this gravitating object is, if you're outside that ob gravitating object, it will treat as if the entire mass is, com uh, is concentrated at the center. Okay. So, if, it is, if you're outside it, if you're inside that, then it will not uh, consider uh, that the gravitation effect of gravitation above that point will not matter. But whatever there is inside it will contribute in the gravitational attraction. But again, it will treat it as if it is inside the uh, on the on the uh, origin. Okay, all right. So something like this. So if the man as a man is falling due to Earth's gravity, okay, this is the solution, right? This is the trajectory. So whether it is falling on this roof or falling onto the ground, it will not matter. It's part of the same. So if somebody is falling, I can just put a platform here, but the projected solution will be exactly the same. So what we did for the neutron star is, this, if this is the size of the neutron star, this R star is the size of the neutron star, we assume the neutron star is keeping the mass and the rotation same. And we and the magnetic field, uh, surface magnetic field increasing uh, uh, with uh, as it would increase for a uh, uh, for a dipolar field. So what we did, we assumed it to be just outside the uh, horizon, okay, up to the RM. So there, in this this solution we call that ghost about which is supposed to be inside the surface. But now it's not because we assume it to be, uh, you know, squeezed uh, down to the uh, that R in. There it is free fall. Okay, so therefore we apply. We can apply the uh, uh, entropy measure that we have devised for black holes. And this region of solution here inside that we assume this size to be inside here. And this solution, part of the solution, we call the ghost solution because it actually does not exist. But we do it, we integrate out up to the surface of the uh, neutron star, and then we stop. Uh, neutron star is no more increasing, it doesn't matter anyway. So, and uh, we find out the solutions outside. Okay. And uh, so we, uh, we integrate it out up to the accretion disk, the, the co rotating, uh, co rotation disk uh, uh, radius. And uh, then we got the solution. And of course, sorry, of course, there also we have a maxima, entropy maxima there. And uh, once we find the solution, 
the solution that we are finding is the this entropy, uh, this supersonic solution. Okay, so once we have find that solution, then what we do, we integrate from the uh, uh, the neutral star surface, and at every point we do the shock jump to see at what point uh, there is shock jump matches the uh, supersonic jump. Okay, so that becomes the shock on the neutral star surface. Okay. So uh, that is how, uh, of course, we need a lot. Uh, uh, we also have to uh, consider the, the cooling there because if there is no cooling, it will, the, the, the velocity, the thermal energy will not be taken away by the cooling and the velocity will not come to zero on, uh, not zero, I mean, it should not be co-rotating with the neutral star surface, okay? So the, the velocity has to go very sm uh, small, otherwise they will be splashing, right? So we don't want that. So if we do uh, once we do that, so there are some regions we also found two shocks. Okay, one on near the surface and the other because of the angular momentum barrier, uh, uh, the centrifugal barrier uh, away from it. And uh, so the, the the small region we still find two shocks here. And uh, the second sorry, the second shock. Uh, the signature of the second shock is a is a slightly stronger tail, hard parallel tail. Uh, so, uh, and uh, this can be also implemented in white dwarfs. So there is some solution with the white dwarfs, but this is much bigger. And uh, to, to find that, it takes a lot of time, but uh, it can be done with the white two temperature solution white dwarfs. So uh, that's it, basically. Uh, so. Equations of motion of fluid in two temperature region is degenerate. This was, as I said, noticed early on, but nobody did anything about it. Okay, and until unless we sort of hit a brick uh, and we have to push it through, we proposed a novel method to break the degeneracy, uh, and we extended this to compact surfaces, to hard surfaces, and this is um, a thesis of my student Shilpa. In the uh, in the neutral star case, Kuldeep also joined another of my students. He has graduated, and in some of the papers, Philip is also there. Uh, but he's also part of this. Thank you very much. Thank you, Indranil. It's a very interesting talk. Questions, comments. Actually, I was very surprised. I mean, I, I thought you know, that the densities must be high in the equation. This, so uh, uh, I always thought in the electrons and protons probably share the same temperature, but the temperature is very high. Yeah. So the equilibration time scale is also very long because of yeah. that. Yeah. Uh, the temperature is like oh, the 10 to the 10 and the, yeah. of that order. So yeah. very interesting. We, I have, a, I mean, I'm thinking about a project, I'm writing a code, but uh, this would be like, uh, with purely Eulerian code, we can't do it because Eulerian code does not conserve angular momentum. So for accretion, this becomes a problem. I'm, I'm trying to do this for uh, Keplerian disk and trying to see, because in Keplerian disk, we don't have an internal time scale. It's very small, right? I mean, very large. So they should equilibrate. Okay, whatever uh -huh. it is going on, they should equilibrate. Uh -huh. Trying to see uh, numerically whether we can achieve that or not. But before that, we have to change the code. And we are trying to write a, a remap, remap to Lagrangian uh, coordinate. Uh, so if we can do that in about a year's time, so would we be able to just, uh, it, these are all, uh, you know, uh, theoretical interest, not like in explaining observations and all, but I have this interest to see that uh, for Keplerian disk, whether it equilibrates or not. It should, but it's better to check. Right. And the idea of, you know, using the maximum entropy to break all the degeneracies of solutions and such, yeah. That's very interesting. The, the, I did not expect it to be such a nice uh, maximum. Mm, mm. I expected it will be absolutely be, behaving like you know mad. And and when it when Shilpa came and showed me that 
it was like i mean what the hell is this i mean why is it behaving so nicely it should not but i was not expecting it to behave so nicely but anyway it did any other questions i have a question yeah go ahead please um in the beginning you showed a slide uh where the uh jet from this micro quasar was shown and it looked very collimated yeah. and in a later uh, slide you also told that uh, the origin of this jet might be the accretion disk yeah so uh, what might collimate the beam if it's coming from accretion disk it should be like yeah, it should be magnetic field so accretion disk should have a magnetic magnetic field and that should collimate there is no i mean this d5 azimuthal component should collimate there is no i mean there is not uh, there are few papers where they are trying to collimate through with the radiation pressure as well but that's not very uh, i mean it's it's a bit contrived in the sense that uh, you know matter is very tenuous so radiation will penetrate mostly not really hold uh, it should be magnetic field yes so magnetic field need not be uh, really strong to do this is it, is it? ah that is a big question <laughs> so yeah so for example the mt7 they measured it to be around 30 dal or something but 30 dal is too low in my opinion uh yeah but it will depend on how much matter you have okay if the matter loading is very high then this 30 gauss will not work okay the density of this matter uh, of this uh, medium has to be fairly low in order that 30 gauss can hold that you know, 30 gauss strength uh, radi- uh, magnetic field can hold the matter uh, i'm mean, calling it the matter and another thing about if you look at this figure you see that the the central object is somewhere here okay and uh, this is the uh, uh, what should i say the angle which is coming out so the initial angle is very high it's around 60 degree for mt7 jet okay and then after that it collimates okay so yeah i mean i don't know why should we do that So I, I don't think M- uh, uh, even MHD doing GR MHD is 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 about. So if if you look at this uh, this uh, MHD seven simulation in EHT, okay, they are taking thick discs. They are not taking thin Keplerian discs. Thick disc with advection and so on, because that that initial collimation they need. Uh, some matter to hold that uh, that the jet that is coming out okay and uh, yeah i mean uh, then then the question is who is putting those you know donuts there so they are starting with thick accretion disk very thick accretion thick donuts and there they are generating i mean they are then they're starting to simulate so that's what i'm saying there yeah? i mean and, and simulations are very good they look very i mean fantastic right but as visually they, they look fantastic but it depends on the boundary conditions tremendously what kind of boundary conditions you are putting what kind of initial conditions you are putting and that needs to be somewhat verified or at least you know tractable through uh, these kind of semi analytical work so when you say above the disk uh, uh, it because starts becoming very collimated so in simulations people put in by hand the magnetic field and the configurations etc of course oh, of okay course. of course you put in by hand I, i mean not by hand they will uh, i mean they will give some current distribution that will oh, oh yeah but that's another way of putting by hand yeah, yeah. okay at least initially okay uh, yeah so i have i have a, uh, one comment here i, I don't know uh, if uh, instead of magnetic field can relativistic boosting uh, make this collimation uh, collimated effect i mean at at the base when the jets are generated it's not relativistic at all 
the velocities are fairly low. The relativistic okay. boosting, one, once it becomes relativistic, the relativistic boosting can. In fact, if you look at purely jet simulations, not these you know, accretion uh, ejection simulations, only jet simulations, then you will see that this, uh, those relativistic jets are uh, collimated. Why? Because this uh, relativistic jet is going and hitting the ambient medium, a part of the matter is coming back, right? So this part of the matter that that uh, uh, that goes back, Absolutely. they hold the uh, the jet B. Sometimes that also creates this Kelvin Helmholtz instabilities and all, but more or less they can hold hold it back. Okay, okay. So, what is the typical uh, boosting values uh, here in this in this case? I mean, yeah, electron's velocity and all. Here uh, in, in the jet. Yes, yes. I mean, in this case. In M eighty seven. Yeah, in I mean, typically. It, the velocities are not too high. The Lorentz factor, maximum Lorentz factor, that is. See, first of all, one uh, one should also understand that there is no direct measure of how fast the jet is moving because of the projection effect okay now, for example okay. these these blobs that are coming out they when if you measure they come out with uh, superluminal speed but that because of it is projected towards you so you never exactly know that what exactly is the uh, speed m87 is very close by so you can see such detailed jets, right? But most of the jets are far, far away. So there is no way you can estimate the, uh, I mean, properly estimate the speed. The speeds are estimated from various factors, like, I mean, the if you look at the radio low, what should be, I mean, what should the time scale in which you have to supply matter to fill up that radio low? And then they have to, these electrons have to be tied down there. Otherwise, the electrons will get lost, right? And you are the very fact you're seeing that radio emission that you mean with this with electrons are there. And then uh, they have to match it with electron, you know, what they call it. Um, uh, no, not the electron losing time scale. Uh, I'm forgetting the name of the time scale. So basically, they lose these electrons, right? So uh, that time scale. So, uh, so matching all those things, you get an estimate, not necessarily the cases where we say that the Lorentz factors are 10, 100, 200, it's not necessarily the, uh, the, uh, that high. But for M87, because it is super luminal, we know what should be the lower limit of that. Okay, I mean, lower limit of the terminal speed. And that probably is few Lorentz factor, okay? around seven, five, six, seven, something like that. So it is relativistic, very relativistic, but if you talk to GRB people and some of the AGN guys, it's not very, very high. Okay, Lorentz factor seven is not really, for uh -huh. jet okay. people, talk okay. about Lorentz factors of 50, 100, and so on. Okay. There is a very good, uh, very good review article by Harris. When was it? 2008 or 2009, he wrote about the jet uh, observation. Okay, there he, he sort of, uh, you know, he, he puts a lot of caveat about all the conclusion, observational conclusions. The annual reviews? Annual review, yeah. Harris, okay. Harris, Harris. It's a very good review. Okay. Oh, that's good. I mean, I mean, big people don't write so many. I mean, about they, they they do not express their confusion so much. I mean, especially in their field of expertise, that is, observe, he's an observer. Oh, I see. Okay. Okay, we'll look up. Fantastic. Any many questions? Things, yeah. No, you go ahead. Go ahead. Now, many things I have. I mean, my physical understanding and my confusions about these things originates from the Harris's uh, review. I love that review. I time to time go back to that review and uh, 
from is it harris or harrison harris harris i'll i'll, I'll send it to you okay, okay thanks oh, somebody has already done that okay oh okay good yeah. any other questions if not then let's thank indranil again for the wonderful talk um thank you indranil thank you very much uh, thank you for calling and, me uh, Hope and to visit Aradai again. I mean, yes, I, please do. Yes, no, yes, no yes. Yeah. Yeah. So, if everyone uh, unmute their mic and clap for Dr. Chattopadhyay, and that would be great. Thank you for.